Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, firstly, welcome everybody, um, those that are in the, in the, uh, in the room here in uh, Sky, uh, Sky Theatre, um, those that are tuning in online uh, around New Zealand, and uh, of course to uh, the Sky City team in, uh, in South Australia. Sky City is privileged to host Dr. Susie Wiles here in Sky Theatre in Auckland uh, today. Um, Dr. Wiles has become one of the primary faces, communicators and educators in New Zealand during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I've longly admired the way she's gone out of her way to help uh, erase the public's anxiety about COVID lockdowns and now the vaccine. Dr. Wiles is a microbiologist who specializes in infectious diseases and bioluminescence. She's an associate professor and head of the bioluminescent superbug bugs lab at the University of Auckland. I probably got that wrong, but uh, <laughs> um, she was also awarded the New Zealand of the Year in 2021. Uh, I think that's deserving a round of applause. Um, we've brought Dr. Waz here today to speak to you, uh, our Sky City Fano, um, about COVID-19 uh, and allow you to ask any questions you might have about the vaccine. Um, it's incredibly important to all of us, our employees, your families, um, New Zealand and our business that everybody that can be is vaccinated as soon as possible. So um, uh, Dr. Waz is going to maybe answer lots and is an opportunity to ask any of the questions that, uh, that you might have. We have more than 4,200 employees across New Zealand and South Australia, and uh, our responsibility is to proactively help you, provide you with information as much as possible so you can be fully informed. And this is one of many things we will be doing over the course of the next few months uh, to help uh, what we could do, what we can do uh, in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine. So, uh, without further ado, I might ask you to give uh, Dr. Susie Wills a warm welcome. Kia ora, and um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to come and talk. Um, I did get given some questions beforehand, so I've tried to incorporate some of the answers to those questions uh, in my slides, so I'm gonna talk for a bit. Uh, but then there will be time to ask some questions if there's things that I have I've missed. Um, but what I will say is while I am Dr. Susie Wiles, I am uh, not a medical doctor. So uh, that means that the really um, technical medical questions uh, are really best to ask your specialist. So if there's some particular health condition that you have or some medication that you're on, you really are best to, to speak to your actual medical doctor rather than your doctor of microbiology that's here today. So with that further ado, so I've basically kind of called my talk um, Vaccines and Variants, because this is really the, I guess, the, the crux of the matter. Um, but what I want to start by doing is getting us all on the same page, which is that this is a serious disease that we are basically um, facing. So these are the statistics uh, that I've just put up today. This is the Johns Hopkins um, uh, COVID tracker. It has number of confirmed cases, uh, so to date, which is the red number, number of deaths uh, in white, and then the really awesome number as well as the number of vaccinations that are happening around the world. Um, and so I remember looking at this tracker every day when they first put it up, wondering when New Zealand was gonna appear on there and you know, when China, the numbers were sort of popping up and we were you know, first in the tens and then the hundreds and then the thousands. So it's just, it's mind boggling to me that we're now at 205 million um, confirmed cases. So this is confirmed cases as well, and over 4 million confirmed deaths. Uh, so this, these numbers will both be a massive underestimate because there are many countries that are either don't have access to testing or just are not testing because they have so many numbers. Um, and what you can see in the red graph at the, um, at the other end is that we're essentially in the third wave of this uh, global wave of this pandemic right now, um, kind of up at over, I think, a million cases a week or something. So the numbers are just absolutely staggering. The th other thing that's really, really important about this, I mean, I'll talk about the why this is a serious thing and it's not just about the numbers um, or, the, or what they call a um, 
it's been called a, a caseidemic or something, so that, you know, it's just like if people test positive, it's just a, po a positive test, it means nothing. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the really important thing about this disease that makes it so hard to deal with is that people are infectious before they realise they are sick. Uh, and some people won't get very sick, but they will still be infectious. Um, and so this is the really hard thing about controlling this. Very similar to, uh, sorry, very different to many other diseases that we have had that have become pandemics that we've got under control. And um, because those diseases had a way that, you know, people were either only infectious once they had symptoms or they had really easy symptoms that were uh, or easy to differentiate and then isolate those people. With this, we've got people present with all manner of symptoms that could be anything, could be hay fever, could be asthma, um, could just be a runny nose, um, and people are, were, in, were infectious for days before that, and the virus had already left them and moved on to the next person. So that's just what's made this so challenging. Um, so not only is this disease deadly in a, in a certain proportion of people who get it, but it's a really quite extraordinary virus that attaches to many different kinds of cells that have this receptor called um, ACE2. Uh, Sorry, ACE1. And um, ACE1, ACE2, I can't remember. Um, and the, so the point is that this can impact on lots of different organs in the body. And what we're finding now is that, um, you know, many people uh, will have these long-term symptoms, uh, so long COVID, and they can be anything from what they term brain fog, so people really struggling to concentrate, their um, impacts on the heart, so some people are finding they're basically left with a racing heart. They're told by their doctors not to exercise anymore. Um, but it essentially can impact on every part of the body um, and leave some people with long-term uh, long symptoms in those different parts of the body. What I want to stress is that we're still also in the really early stages of the, this pandemic. So what we're seeing is still the very early stages of, uh, of, of this sort of impact. And what people like me worry about is what the impact might be on people who've had an infection but recovered in the longer term. And so uh, given that we know it impacts on the pancreas and the lungs uh, and the brain, the real worry is what are we going to start to see in two to five years' time? Are we going to see a whole bunch of people developing dementia early? Are we going to see them developing um, diabetes early? All of these kinds of things. And I think the answer is probably yes. Um, the other thing I want to touch on a little bit is that, uh, is that kind of dementia and brain fog thing. So this is, um, all I want you to take from this graph is that it's basically the results of a, of a, a study um, done in the UK. It's kind of not a proper scientific study in that it was a, um, a what we call a citizen science study, uh, which was a collaboration between researchers and the BBC um, TV show Horizon. And basically what they did was the researchers developed a series of online tests, which they called the Great British Intelligence Test. Um, and then they asked people to do the, this test online. So this was something that was planned before the pandemic. It, um, it kind of went live in sort of January 2020. Um, but that meant that they ended up carrying it out during the first wave of uh, infections in the UK. And so during the month of May, they ended up adding a questionnaire that asked people about whether they had experienced any symptoms that could be COVID-19. And if they had, were they a confirmed case? What kind of symptoms had they been hospitalized? Uh, and so what they were able to do with that data is basically look at the difference between people who had said that they had had COVID and what their symptoms were versus those who hadn't to have a look at their, um, their, their uh, how they did on these um, brain tests. So it wasn't really an IQ test, but it was lots of things that look at um, how the brain functions. And what this graph shows you is that basically the more symptoms people had, the more severe their, they said their disease was, the more likely they were to have lower test scores than people who um, had not or said they didn't have COVID-19. And to put this in perspective, for those people who had needed to be hospitalized and ventilated, their scores were the equivalent of somebody who'd had a stroke. So this is quite serious stuff. And some of these people were people who didn't have the symptoms anymore. And so the question here is, are people being left with long-term potential damage to their brains or changes in their brains? Um, uh, after being infected. Uh, and here's uh, another one that people might want to bear in mind. So we are starting to see reports of people getting what we're calling sexual dysfunction after infection. Um, so I like this mask up to keep it up. Um, so, so some people are experiencing um, erectile dysfunction, some people are experiencing premature ejaculation, some people are experiencing the inability to ejaculate anymore. So. Um, 
again, this is a kind of system that, uh, you know, it impacts on the cells of, uh, of um, our, um, yeah, blood system, all sorts of things. And so um, this particular organ of the body, which requires blood to function uh, in some ways, um, that seems to be impacted too. So I think is a real reason why I would say this is serious. All right, so let me talk about the variants then. So now we're all on the same page about this disease not being something that we should, uh, you know, take lightly. I'm going to start by showing you this video, which is about bacteria, and bacteria are very different from viruses. But this really beautifully, I think, illustrates what we are seeing happen around the world with these variants. So it's an experiment done by this um, scientist called Michael Baum at Harvard. And what he did was he basically designed this ginormous Petri dish. It's a metre long by half a metre wide. And it gets divided into sections. And then what he does is he puts this jelly that bacteria grow on um, into these different sections. And he adds um, antibiotic that would kill that bacteria um, into these different sections. So on the ends, there's no antibiotic, there's just the jelly, and then there's just an amount that normally kills the bacteria, then 10 times, 100 times, and 1,000 times. And then he adds another layer of jelly on the top of that, but this one's a bit sloppy, so if a bacteria's got a tail, it can swim through it. Then he basically adds a little bit of bacteria to the ends with no antibiotic, and he sets his time-lapse camera, and then we watch the bacteria grow. So that's in white. We can see the bacteria, they grow over that area where there's no antibiotic, and then you can see they get to the edge where there is antibiotic, and they stop until there's a mutant that can grow in the presence of the antibiotic. And so they will start to grow, and we see them popping up all over the place, and we see them competing with each other and making these amazing shapes. Um, most of them will stop at the next barrier where there's more antibiotics. Some of them will carry on through, but um, if they are to grow in that next one, next one, they need sometimes new mutations that will allow them to grow in that 10 times more antibiotic. Um, and then the same happens when they get to a, um, 100 times um, the amount of antibiotic normally kills them. And then you'll see them finally get to the middle where they are now able to grow, or a mutant is able to grow on a thousand times the amount of antibiotic that would have normally killed it. There's our winner there. So what you're watching here is, so this, this is um, bacterium E. coli. It lives in the gut of most people and animals. He then can work out what mutations have happened. Um, that process took 11 days. Um, and so in 11 days, E. coli can become resistant to a 1,000 times the amount of antibiotic that would normally kill it. And so as I said, this is a completely natural process. So it happens in our cells, it happens in bacteria, it happens in viruses. So every time um, a cell or a virus or bacterium gets replicated, there's the opportunity for, just by sheer chance, for mistakes to get made um, when the, the genetic material of that cell gets replicated. And most of the time, those um, mistakes mean nothing. They just are kind of neutral, and so the, they'll, they'll be that little mistake there, but it won't have any impact on the growth of the bacteria or the virus. Um, but sometimes their mistake will uh, be detrimental, and so the bacteria or the virus will, will no longer be able to do its job um, to survive or get to the next host if it's a virus. And sometimes, um, if it's in the right conditions, that mutation will give the cell an advantage, in which case that one will take off. So, so those neutral uh, mutations are basically what allows us to do all this ge um, genetic sequencing and genotyping and basically being able to show which uh, people are linked to, to which in, a, in an outbreak by looking at those kind of neutral um, little changes. So what we see is that when uh, the, so essentially what the virus is doing is turning every cell into a virus producing factory. So lots and lots of viruses being produced means lots of potential mistakes can get made. Um, and then we see those when you get the next person gets infected, you can see whether um, you know, a little mistake has been made. And so the virus very slowly but surely starts to change. And so this here is essentially a family tree of the COVID-19 virus, starting um, with 19A, which is essentially the um, original variants of the virus. And then as the virus has moved around the world in people, um, you know, these little changes have been made. And so we started to see these different sort of family um, lines kind of emerge. But because there's been so much transmission, what we're now starting to see is uh, basically these mutations that are giving the virus an advantage. And the big advantage we're seeing is in transmission. So this is now how we've got these what are called variants of concern, which are ones that um, are generally more infectious. 
Um, the WHO has this kind of classification system, so what they would consider a variant of concern is one that is more infectious or is more deadly or um, is able to get around our immune response uh, or our vaccines better. So these are, they started to be named um, by the, those family trees, by their lineages, and so this is how we had the B117, if you remember, and um, what have we had, B, there's all sorts of P1, all sorts of things. Um, so the WHO decided to make it easier for everyone to remember these things by calling them after letters of the Greek alphabet. And I did just, so this is how we got uh, Delta. So Delta is the variant, the name of the variant that we now know is extremely infectious. So it looks like when people are infected, they have a thousand times more, back, uh, more virus in, um, in their first PCR test when they test positive. So it looks like they are just shedding huge amounts more um, virus. Uh, and that's why we're starting to see many more infected people from a single infected case. Um, so we're, we've got, so, so the scientists have been able to also look at these mutations and start to see um, essentially uh, which mutations they think are giving the, the virus an advantage. And so this means they're starting to follow other ones. As we, as we sequence, sequence um, viruses around the world, we're, they're looking for these mutations. And so it's the combination of mutations that kind of turn them from a variant of concern, which might just have one or two of these um, mutations, to a, ver uh, sorry, a variant of interest to a variant of concern when it's got lots and lots of those mutations. So the scientists are watching this all the time. Um, and I guess the question is how much worse could it possibly get? Um, the WHO admitted the other day that they're probably soon going to run out of letters of the Greek alphabet, and so now they're starting to think about whether they're going to start to call them after constellations. So that just gives you some idea of how many they think might end up um, happening. So this is just a little bit of data taken from a few months ago. Um, and what I just want to show you here, actually it hasn't come up very well, but essentially um, this is just different places in the UK. Uh, and there are supposed to be two colors on the slide, if you can see them. There's the really bright red, and then there's a sort of um, a not quite uh, kind of peachy color. And so the variant of concern that, was, that arose in the UK, um, alpha, that was much more infectious than the original variants was sort of taking over, took over um, late last year. When Delta came, it completely wiped the floor with it. And so that red that you see is this exponential growth in cases um, with Delta. And so we're seeing Delta kind of sweep around and take um, hold in most places because it is so much more infectious. So the take home message from this is it's a completely natural process. The more people are infected, the more chances there are for this natural process to happen. And so the more people are infected, the more the virus will continue to evolve. And the question is, what is going to happen to it? Is it just gonna become more and more infectious um, or will something else happen? And we really don't know the answer to that question, uh, unfortunately. It's gonna be kind of just watching and see what happens. Okay, so part two, the vaccines. So this has been the really amazing, I think, thing about the pandemic has been to watch how a process that used to take 10 to 15 years, you know, to get from kind of the lab to the clinic um, has, uh, with the COVID-19 vaccines, taken in some cases less than a year. I think that's absolutely amazing, um, but will also probably be a reason why some people are a little bit concerned. So it turns out that the, the, the sort of 10 to 15 years that it's taken in the past to uh, make a medicine and get it through clinical trials um, is because there is a process. So it has to go through phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And then it has to, all that information has to get processed and, and sent to a regulator. Um, but what has happened in the past, or happens with pretty much everything, uh, is that those processes happen one after the other, usually with many years in the middle while everybody tries to find the money to get to the next stage. What happened with COVID-19 is that um, scientists all around the world were ready to start making vaccines using all of the ways that we know how to make vaccines and some experimental ways. Um, governments around the world threw money at it, um, and so many scientists, researchers, uh, and money was thrown at this problem that basically all of those processes were happening um, really well staggered. So as soon as it looked like the phase one trials were going well, the phase two trials were started. As soon as the phase two trials looked like they were going well, the phase three trials were started. And all that data that was being gathered was given to the regulators at the same time as it was being gathered. So they could watch the watch what, and, and, um, and I guess digest all the information about the vaccines as it was happening. Um, and so that meant that they were able to make a decision about whether to approve uh, them uh, or not 
um, very quickly after the phase three trials were um, were uh, were finished. Um, I guess so. By finished, I will also say that um, the trials are still happening. In that we want to know how long people's immune response lasts for. So people who were in the trials will be followed for some years to um, looking at their antibody responses and see what happened to them. So that is completely natural and no reason not to authorize the vaccines for use um, before the end of that time. So uh, yeah, so it's kind of been amazing and it just shows what we can achieve that like we really shouldn't be accepting that it's gonna take 10 to 15 years for a drug to be approved. Um, it's really about kind of money and stuff. Somebody's on the phone. Okay, so this is where we're at. Um, there are an extraordinary number of different vaccines in different um, uh, stages of this uh, of testing. So here we've got um, so over 50 that are in kind of those phase one safety tests, which is looking at doses and looking at safety. Then we've got 41 in phase two, so this is sort of an expanded trial where you put them in more people. Um, 32 that are in phase three, uh, 11 that are authorized, eight approved, and five that have been abandoned for various reasons. Um, and so it's those ones that have essentially been either authorized or approved that are now being uh, rolled out into people. And as we can see, billions and billions of doses have been delivered. So back in the... Um, I guess back at the start of the pandemic, when all this discussion about what vaccines, you know, what was being developed, um, is when our government would have started negotiations with uh, different companies. So the Ministry of Health pulled together a vaccine task force full of um, experts in vaccination, uh, and they were basically um, chosen to essentially decide, um, you know, if, if we think of this as a horse race, which horses should our government back? And so what our government did was essentially put uh, money on several horses because uh, we didn't know which ones would work and which ones, you know, and, and how that would go. So there were lots of different ways, tried and tested ways to make vaccines. Um, and we put a large amount of, or we put these pre-orders in for three of those. Um, so three kind of different ways um, that are well-known ways. Uh, backing companies that are well-known to uh, do this really well. So they, you know, they've got lots of vaccines on the market, um, which are the big ones. So Novavax, Janssen, and AstraZeneca. And then we put a tiny amount of an order in for the new, uh, the new horse, the one, the dark horse that nobody really knew about, which was this new technology, the mRNA technology. Um, and this was because it was uh, experimental in that it's had 30 odd years of lab research behind it and all the animal research, but had never been, um, never got, there'd never been uh, a good enough reason, I guess, to get investors interested in putting it into human trials. But the really amazing thing about the mRNA technology is it's very quick to make a new vaccine. So they were the first ones when COVID appeared, as soon as we had a sequence for that virus, they were the first ones to start making a vaccine. And so that was the first one that then got put into human trials. And so then it was the first one out of the human trials and the results looked amazing. Um, and it's so because those results looked so amazing that then um, our government said, okay, we're actually gonna go with this one and ordered enough for all of us. So this just shows you some of the data from those trials. So essentially, the further over that way the dot is, the more effective the vaccine was in the trials. Um, this just shows for four different vaccines. So the Pfizer and the Moderna are these new mRNA ones, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then the AstraZeneca and the Janssen are the, are the more tried and tested ways of making um, vaccines. And this just shows for different ages, for different groups of people, essentially how effective this was. And what blew us all away was how effective those mRNA vaccines are. They are just amazingly effective in the kind of 90%, whereas everything else is kind of sort of 60 to 70%. So that means more than nine out of 10 people who are vaccinated with those mRNA vaccines will be protected versus six or seven out of 10 for the other vaccines. So I guess one of the things to say is that, you know, here in New Zealand, we are rolling out that the one. In other countries, they're doing something different. Um, the best vaccine is the one in your arm. The second best vaccine would be one of the mRNA ones. So um, the really important thing is that even if um, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines are not available, uh, you know, wherever you are, a vaccine is better than no vaccine. And so I highly, and then 
two doses is better than one. So you, you should definitely get fully vaccinated with whatever is basically available. Okay, so being a bit more specific though about the Pfizer vaccine, because this is what we're using here in New Zealand, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what is in it, um, because I've heard all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so here's the ingredients list. So the active ingredient is basically this modified mRNA of the spike protein. So essentially when that, so the reason the, um, the um, COVID-19 virus, um, the, its name, it's basically a coronavirus, and it gets that name corona because when you look at them under a microscope, they look like a crown. So they have these big spikes that stick out that are called the spike protein. Um, and so what the, what the virus is doing when it infects your cells is it's basically turning your cells into virus-producing factories. And one of the big um, uh, proteins they make is the spike protein, and it's the one that it uses to attach to your cells. So that's how it gets into your cells. It's also the protein that your immune response recognizes as being the virus, and so that's what our antibodies are made to. So the only thing we need in order to recognize that the virus, uh, or to recognize the virus is the spike protein. And so what we're basically doing with this technology is taking the little bit of information that tells our cell to make a spike protein, and we're basically giving that to our cells. So that's this active ingredient, and I'll explain a little bit more about mRNA in a minute. Then, so mRNA is really fragile. Think of it like a photocopy of paper, but one that's uh, maybe really, really thin. Uh, and so what you have to do is you have to treat it very gently and protect it. And so what, uh, what they do is basically protect it with these very complicated sounding chemicals, which are basically fats. So we just kind of wrap it in a ball of fat, and that basically protects it. Um, the, and, and so the difference, so Pfizer and Moderna will differ a little bit by what their, the, what their fatty ingredients are, because they've kind of come up with different formulations. This is a completely known technology, so there are lots of different drugs that we give this way by wrapping them in fats, so it's not something to be frightened of. But it was when, um, in the, there are some people who um, can get an allergic reaction if they have taken these drugs before and they've basically mounted an immune response, usually to, um, I think it's polyethylene glycol or something, is one of the ingredients. So that's why when you have the vaccine, you have to stay for 20 to 30 minutes. It's just to make sure that you have not had a, you know, you, you aren't going to have an allergic reaction. And if you do have an allergic reaction, you're basically in the right place where they can uh, look after you and you'll be, you'll be absolutely fine. The other thing um, that's in these vaccines is salts. So these are, you might recognize, um, sodium chloride, that's salt. Um, so these are all just salts, and that's just basically to make sure that it's at the same pH as your cells. Um, and then because this is really fragile, and so we wrap it in this fatty coat, and then we keep it at really low temperatures, um, we have to um, give it something to make sure it's protected at low temperatures. And so the other um, ingredient is sugar, sucrose. So that's it. Nothing magnetic, nothing... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> dubious, some salts, some sugars, some fats, and this mRNA. The other thing you might have heard is that this is a nano vaccine. So what that means is that um, those fats are actually um, nanoparticle sized fats. And that's because every, the, because we put the, this mRNA inside the fat, the smaller we can make the fats, the more, um, the more globules of fat we can have in a vaccine, the more bits of mRNA we can put in it. So this is just showing you basically what that looks like. We just get these little, so this has just been put on a nano scale, basically these tiny little bits of fat inside of them is this little bit of um, mRNA. Okay, so really quickly, what is all this mRNA about? So what's so cool about this technology is it's using uh, something, a, a process that happens in every one of our cells every day. So we have um, basically, we're made up of DNA, that's the, that's the, um, the kind of instruction manual to make each of us. Um, and that DNA uh, is kept protected in the nucleus of our cells. But that's the, that's the recipe to make a human being, and so we do need to, you know, we need to read that recipe and, and then make a human being or make whatever it is that our cells want to make. So what our, what our cells have is an ability, um, because we don't want that DNA to leave the nucleus, we make a photocopy, and this photocopy is basically this mRNA. And so the mRNA photocopy is made in the nucleus, and then it leaves the nucleus and heads to the rest of the cell, which is called the cytoplasm, 
uh, to these little machines called ribosomes, and then the ribosomes basically read that photocopy and say, what is it you need me to make? Uh, and so is, do you need me to make insulin? Do you need me to make whatever? I don't know, pink hair, whatever. Um, then that's what those little ribosomes do. So what we're doing with the mRNA vaccine is we're basically giving ourselves this photocopy uh, that basically says to the cell, to the ribosome, please make this viral spike protein for us. So our ribosomes do that. Um, this thing, because it's fragile, it doesn't last very long, so it probably only lasts a few hours or days, and then it basically gets degraded, so your ribosomes will make a little bit of the spike protein. Your cells then go, hang on a minute, this, this is not human, don't like this at all. They basically chop it up into pieces, and then they show it to the, to the immune cells of our body. Our immune cells go, right, yep, got it, I'm gonna make antibodies. And that means the net then, then when we get infected with the virus, our bodies go, hang on a minute, I've seen this before, I know what this is, and then we mount a much quicker immune response than if we'd never seen the virus before. So we're just using a process that our cells use every day. It's very clever. We're very clever, I think we can say. Okay, so um, we are, so in order to sort of understand what's happening with the um, uh, you know with these uh, vaccines, in particular, we're watching countries like Israel, which um, basically signed a deal with Pfizer really early on to roll out this vaccine. So after the clinical trials were done, they started rolling out this vaccine throughout their population. They started in early January, and so this just shows that we're up now to 60 odd percent of the um, of Israel vaccinated with Pfizer. And in order to get that vaccine, the agreement they made was that they would basically give all the data back to Pfizer for the rest of us to understand how does this actually roll out. So what's, when we know what it does in the clinical trials, it's like over 90% protective, we would expect in the real world it wouldn't be quite so protective, and so this is what's giving us data on how protective it really is. Um, and it's absolutely astonishing, basically. So it looks like it's really, really good in the real world too. But this is also giving us information on um, things like side effects. So um, these are uh, basically just showing you what side effects you can expect after your first and second dose. So the reason there are two doses is the first dose is all about priming your body, and then the second dose is the booster. Some people don't respond well in that priming boost, so, uh, in the priming dose, so the booster is to make sure they kind of get mopped up and you still get someone, uh, you still get someone responding. Um, and we see this with the protection, so we see that one dose is better than no dose, but two doses is definitely better than one. And so the biggest side effect is it hurts where you've just been injected. Well, you've just been injected, so that's not unsurprising. Um, people feel tired, they might have a headache, uh, muscle pain. We certainly see, and we, you're more likely to experience them after the second vaccine than the first, and that's because if you have already mounted an immune response, you're gonna mount, you, know, you are gonna mount an immune response again when you, when you get that second vaccine. I would say that all of these are, well, more or less all of them, are your body doing its job, your immune response reacting to the fact that it is making uh, something, um, and these are, while they're unpleasant, they are not, nothing to worry about, and they're kind of reasons to go, awesome, my job, my body is doing its job. That's not to say if you don't have any symptoms that you should worry it's not doing its job. It's just perhaps not quite as hyperactive as someone who is experiencing symptoms. So these are all um, to be expected, not at all a worry. So I said that thing about staying a little bit because we have seen some people um, very rarely, though, uh, mount, you know, have an allergic reaction. Um, what are the other things that we're starting to see? So because these have been given now to millions and millions of people, we are starting to see the really rare things. So one of them that's popped up is um, heart inflammation, uh, and this seems to be happening in younger, mostly men, so 16 to 24 year olds. It is very, very rare, uh, and um, generally can, as can be, um, you can be looked after. Some people have to be hospitalized. What we know is that heart impacts are a real thing that happens with COVID and your chances if you get COVID are much higher. So the vaccine, even if you are a young man, is still safer than getting COVID. Um, I've had lots of questions about how, you know, people worried about fertility and all these kinds of things. And we're starting to see lots and lots of reports now of people being absolutely fine. So there's one there, does mRNA vaccine influence patients' performance during IVF? 
no. So, there, you know, there's many people um, going through IVF, they're, they're at this, it's all successful. Um, there's been people looking at sperm before and after vaccination, no impact on sperm. Um, they're looking at the ovaries, no impact. So it looks like these are completely safe. Um, and certainly um, uh, there's plenty of pregnant people who are getting vaccinated um, and it's looking absolutely fine for them too. And what they say is of the four vaccines that are being used in North America and Europe, um, none of them contain any components that are uh, or any worry for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. What we know is that if you are vaccinated in the last trimester of pregnancy, then you will mount a good anti antibody response and your antibodies will transfer to the baby and will also protect them uh, in their early weeks of life. So this is all looking um, really, really good. There is, there's nothing that would make us um, worry here about any long-term things. The current unknowns are how long will these different vaccines protect us for? So this is the idea that we mount an immune response, but it might not last forever. So there are some vaccines that you know you need to have, um, like a tetanus booster, you can have that every 10 years. So there are some that we have to have more regularly. Because this has only been going for a year and a half, it's only been you know, in people for less than a year, um, we don't know how long those antibodies will protect for. And that might be one reason we have to have boosters is just to bring everybody's protection back up again. The other thing we don't know yet also is will they protect us against all variants? So they're certainly looking pretty good against the variants that are some of the variants that are existing at the moment, like Delta. There are some other variants that we know are arising in some countries that look like they're less protective against. Those variants don't seem to be as infectious, so they may well be being displaced by Delta. I guess the worry is what happens if Delta not only becomes more infectious, but it actually then starts to get these changes that mean that we don't, um, antibodies aren't so great. And that's why, again, we might have to have boosters. It'll be to reformulate them so that they work against the spike protein of whatever um, evolved viruses we face in the future. This is also why the mRNA technology is so cool is because it will be really quick to reformulate that and remake them. And there's no reason that they would be any different to the ones that have been tested already. The other thing that we don't know yet and would be kind of a cool development um, is whether the second generation vaccines will be non-needle vaccines because that would be awesome because lots of people do not like needles. Um, it would be really amazing if we could make them intranasal or oral vaccines that would make them much easier to deliver, certainly be easier to deliver them to children. And so there are trials of some vaccines that are trying these different formulations. So that may be, but it might also not be. So if you don't like needles, please don't wait. <laughs> because we don't know whether these will come or, or when they will come. Okay, so the last sort of bits are um, why get vaccinated? So the data that's coming is basically showing, and unfortunately, that it doesn't protect you completely. So what we had hoped is that if you were vaccinated, it would be like a shield, a force field, and you really wouldn't get infected at all. Um, we are seeing people test positive even if they've been vaccinated, but the chances of them um, having symptoms, the chances of them having needing hospitalisation or being ventilated or dying are so much lower. So this is just some data from Singapore, um, basically showing uh, so fully vaccinated. So essentially green is basically um, uh, kind of um, either mild or no symptoms. Uh, and what we're seeing is the, the, number, the number of um, vaccinated and non-vaccinated people who are turning up in hospital uh, is quite different. So they do look like they protect against serious disease and that is a really good thing. What we need to remember though is those vaccines are not just about us as individuals. So um, what's, you know, what's, what, what's really good about vaccines is the more of us that are vaccinated, and even though people are testing positive, we are seeing a difference between how long people seem to be shedding virus for. So it should, even if some people are infectious and vaccinated, um, they are probably less infectious than people who are not vaccinated. So it does look like those vaccines, you know, not only protect us as individuals, but they should still also protect us um, as communities. So the more people in a household who are vaccinated, the less chance we're going to have of, of COVID coming in and basically making anybody in that house sick. Um, and this is really important for us at the moment because actually there are a huge um, number of our population are not able to get vaccinated yet, and that's all of our children. So at the moment, the vaccine is approved for over 16s, um, and 
the data's in for over 12s, it looks absolutely fine, but there's no, the trials are still happening on younger children. And so this is, it, this is why I'm one of the people who's saying we cannot open up, even if all the grown-ups are vaccinated, because our children would be vulnerable. And we know that children get COVID less. Um, that was certainly true with the earlier variants, but kind of Delta's changing all that now. And I just wanted to show you some data from um, uh, the USA. So the, essentially the, the um, yellow graph in the middle is the number of um, hospitalizations in zero to 17 year olds. And so we saw that first, you know, we've seen these waves where some children are hospitalized, but just look at that line, the straight line at the end. So there are some states that are basically, because they're opening up schools, there's no masking, there's no ventilation, but they have mass community transmission, we are seeing more and more children being hospitalized. Um, and there are calls from various places saying their pediatric intensive care units are now full. So we do not have many pediatric intensive care beds. And the, if this was to happen in New Zealand, they would be full. And the really awful thing is they would probably be full of Māori and Pacifica children. And I think that would be abhorrent to allow that to happen. Um, so I said we were following what's happening in Israel. Uh, so as we saw, Israel got you know really um, great coverage in grown-ups. Um, so they were under really quite strict restrictions. They rolled out their vaccine program, and then basically they started to open up. And we see now that um, basically those, these are daily cases. They're up now at over 4,000 cases a day. This has happened in just two months after opening up, even though if, you know, many people are vaccinated. Um, and so we're starting to see, uh, unfortunately, deaths. So one thing to bear in mind about um, Israel is it's only just, I think their population is like eight point some, maybe eight or nine million. So consider like this twice New Zealand size. Um, so at their peak, they were having 60 deaths a day that got right down with their, with their um, lockdowns. Um, but they're now up at 10 deaths a day. So this for us would be like five deaths a day. And remember, we've had 26 throughout this entire pandemic so far. So no one is safe until everyone is safe. This means on a community level, but actually this also means globally. Um, and one of the big problems with the pandemic is that um, vaccines are not, made are not being made available um, throughout the world. So the West is essentially hogging them, hoarding them in many countries, and this means that most people in Southern Africa and other countries aren't even being vaccinated. So elderly people who are most vulnerable, healthcare workers who are most at risk, most of them are unvaccinated in most of the world. Um, and so this is why, both for us and both for many other places, we're gonna to need to stick with the cheese model for some time to come. So this is all about having multiple kind of things. It's not just the vaccine that's gonna protect us, it's gonna be all sorts of things. You know, the Prime Minister signaled that there's uh, gonna be some changes to the border, but we're gonna need these controls in place for some time to basically stop the virus. If we do let it in, we have to stop it from um, uh, spreading because we just have to watch what's happening in New South Wales, really, to see what happens when it lets, lets loose. So just for the last few minutes, I want to touch on um, misinformation and disinformation, because this is the thing I think everyone needs to understand, is that on a daily basis, you are probably being bombarded with information, fake information about the virus and about the vaccines. Um, and this is a big problem for us, right? The more people believe this information, the less people will get vaccinated, the more vulnerable it makes us all. What I want to tell you is that the vast majority of that information you're seeing that's fake about the vaccine can be traced back to just 12 accounts in the USA. Um, these people are creating that information and then spreading it on social media and then it's being picked up and repackaged for New Zealanders, for Australians, for everyone else. The reason they're doing that is because they're making money. So they're either selling something, whether it's a book or a crap treatment or uh, access to their webinars, um, like life drop, drops of life, $110. Like, so people are making fake information to basically sell stuff. And what's really sad is that the social media companies, despite the fact that they are breaking all the rules, are not shutting them down. And that's because these 12 accounts are so big that they basically earn those companies about a billion dollars a year in, re in um, advertising revenue. So we're seeing these people just kind of allowed to create this fake content because they're using it to sell their stuff. And then, as I say, what we're seeing here is people in New Zealand, different groups in New Zealand, picking up that information, repackaging it so that it appeals to New Zealanders, appeals to Australians, um, and then basically uh, 
frightening everybody and making them think that the vaccines uh, are awful or that the pandemic is fake. So here are just some things. If you see any information that has these features to it, I would suggest it's probably not true and to not share it. Put it in the bin. So one of those is someone who is downplaying the pandemic or the virus, basically saying it's all been blown out of all proportion. Everything we're seeing is as a result of our response to the virus rather than the virus itself. That is simply not true. You'll see them emphasize individual freedoms rather than collective uh, behavior. What New Zealand has shown really well is that when we act collectively for our greater good, we have the best outcome. This has been shown by research all around the world before the pandemic. And so people who are spreading this idea that it's about your choice, and it is your choice, but I would hope that you would choose to protect yourself and your family, right? This is not about your freedoms, it's about everyone's freedoms. And the really sad thing is that when people choose this freedom of their own, they are making decisions that are impacting on everyone else's freedoms. They'll often want your contact details. That's probably because they'll want to ask you for money or they'll try to sell you something. They'll certainly be, often be pushing something, whether it's a, a natural or a simple cure. If only there was a simple cure, frankly, we would be using it. Um, and they're gonna try and make you feel really fearful or angry. So we know that information that is designed to spread well is, is uh, basically information that makes you scared or um, angry. People will push that thing. Everyone's got to see this because I'm so cross about it. So if you see this, pause and then throw it in the bin. Um, do not share that stuff. Uh, so with that, I will hopefully you feel a little bit more armed with both how to uh, recognize information that's being spread to um, basically to manipulate you. And hopefully I've answered most of your questions about uh, the vaccine itself. Um, but with that, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. I think you have actually. We, we did get at least a dozen um, questions that were sent in before today's session. Uh, and most of them you have um, covered off. I think I, I wanted to ask you personally, did you ever feel, believe that you would be in this situation in your <laughs> lifetime? No. <laughs> um, so I guess, um, so I spent like the last 10 years uh, learning how to communicate science because as a researcher, I think it's really important. So I'm publicly funded. Actually, most of my work is funded by donations. And so I kind of feel like the public have a right to know what I do with their money. So that means I need to talk about our research because I haven't told you anything about at the moment. Um, and so that's meant that over the last kind of 10 years, I've learned how to, so I started on blogging and I do stuff on radio. I was doing things, um, learned that uh, journalists, if they call you, you need to answer your phone straight away because the story is usually gonna run in the next like two hours and you don't, you can't leave it till tomorrow. So kind of learning how to communicate in these different ways meant that over the last 10 years, I've kind of been one of the media's sort of go-to people in terms of, um, microbiology stories. So when we had the Fonterra botulism scare, I spent many hours on the phone explaining all about botulism to journalists. Um, when Zika virus came, I was asked about that. And so to be honest, when in January, when last year, when my phone started ringing and they were like, so tell us about this mystery pneumonia in Wuhan, I just thought, oh, here we go again. And never for a moment did I think that it would turn into this. Um, but I must say, within about two weeks, it was really clear that this wasn't anything we'd experienced before. So uh, at some point in February, I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna have to put everything aside and focus on this. Because again, the research shows that, you know, communities that come together for the greater good are the ones that survive disasters. You know, contrary to what all of our uh, kind of apocalyptic literature and movies would have us you know, believe, like that's not how we should behave. Um, and also that we, um, when we panic, we don't act in our best interests. So really early on, I decided that if it would be helpful, I would just try and be calm, trying to keep everyone else calm and try and empower people so that they felt like they at least would understand why decisions were being made by the government. Because I was hopeful at that stage the government would make the right decisions. Um, I wanted everyone to know how to respond. And so it just became one of those kind of get on the train and you don't quite know where it's going, but you're just gonna ride it, so yeah. The fact that it ro rode us here is just like, and, and being New Zealander of the year, that's just like the weirdest, weirdest thing. Um, and, and, and feels wrong in many ways because again, you know, we've been, a, we are a team, we've been a team. You know, every day Delta arrives on our shores. 
And every day, there are thousands of people around the country who keep us safe, all our people in managed isolation, you know, all of those people. And so I feel weird that everyone knows me as the COVID lady when there's all these people who are the ones keeping us safe. So, mm. yeah, it's an odd, odd thing. On the subject of Delta, one of the questions we received was, does being vaccinated protect a person from new variants such as Delta? So at the moment it looks pretty protective, um, but the question is what's going to come next, and that's just what we don't know. Um, unfortunately, the more community transmission there is, the more opportunity uh, there is for the virus to evolve, and we don't know how it's going to evolve. We, we, I mean, there are so there are scientists who are doing some experiments, not with the virus because that would be really dangerous, um, but taking things like the spike protein or other proteins that the virus has, um, and doing these kind of evolutions and saying, okay, so what what does this do? So there are lab experiments that are saying, okay, these mutations will make it better able to bind to a cell. And so that's when these, when we see these mutations appear in the sequencing, they can go, okay, we've seen that one and that makes them bind better, so that we might watch that one, right? Um, so they're kind of doing those, those sorts of experiments, but um, the big experiment is happening all around us. And the, and, the, and the thing that's also making it a bit of an experiment is that every country is behaving slightly differently. So we've got all these different, you know, we can see which approaches work and which ones don't by the fact that everybody's doing something slightly differently. What would you say to people that are perhaps reluctant to get the vaccine now because they're worried they're going to have to dif have a different one in six months' time? Well, I mean, oh, goodness. So they're safe. They are pretty damn effective. If we had an outbreak tomorrow, I mean, you'd, I would want to be protected. Um, and we may well, you know, we don't know how frequently we're going to have to boost. To be honest, so I also feel really uncomfortable as a relatively healthy person in a place where there's no community transmission, being vaccinated against, uh, being vaccinated in, um, before vulnerable people or healthcare workers in countries with massive transmission that have no access to vaccines, right? Yeah. I will get vaccinated because we, ha we have to do it. We have the vaccines here. So a vaccine that's not used as a wasted vaccine, and that, again, is abhorrent. Um, what I've done uh, is there's a, a, a fantastic site called um, Go Give One, where you can basically buy vaccines for other people. So um, that's what I do on a regular basis. I'm like, I'm just going to go buy someone else a vaccine today. Um, so I feel like we should all be doing that. Um, because the WHO have actually said we shouldn't be boosting right now. We should be making sure that production of the vaccines is... Um, you know, rather than boosting people who are already protected or s somewhat protected, we should be making sure there's capacity to vaccinate people who aren't vaccinated at all. So it, it may be that um, our government goes with that and says, okay, we won't order more boosters. We will, you know, either buy some vaccines for someone else or make sure that, you know, put pressure on companies to do that. Um, but there, it's, it's undoubtedly... Uh, if this continues, there will be boosters probably needed at some stage. We've recently, in the couple of, last couple of days, seen the government change tact in terms of the amount of time that you should have between your injections. What's your view on that? Yeah, so one of the reasons... So, so for pretty much all our other vaccines, we do leave quite some time between them because we know that the longer you leave, the better the or the longer-lasting the um, response is likely to be. The reason there is a three-week... Um, period is actually to do with the fact that this is such, um, you know, when this is clearly such a disaster that when they were designing the trials, the trials were designed to try and get us the best answer the quickest. So that three weeks is, is um, what we know in immunology as how long it takes to make that first response. Um, and then so that would be the, the sort of shortest window you'd want to give before you gave the booster. Um, and so that was what they trialed and that showed us it was really effective. But what um, the UK played this really quite frightening game at the time, which was, well, we just want um, people, as many people as possible, to have some protection. So what they did was they just said, have one dose, and then we're going to wait a few months and try and get as many people given one dose as possible. People like me freaked out about that because one of the things we were really worried about is what happens when the virus meets a partial immune response. That might, uh, it, it might evolve to become more likely to evade our vaccines. Um, 
What it showed instead was actually that you got a better response, or not, a, not necessarily a better response, but a longer lasting response. And so that's why um, now that data's coming out, so the government said, okay, well, we can, we can do that too. Uh, and so they've, they've put that in. In, in. If you are someone who is vulnerable, the, it's still better to probably go for the shorter gap so that you are fully protected um, should we have an outbreak. But for most people, waiting will be fine. We have received a number of questions from people being concerned about being pregnant and having the vaccine. You did cover that off in your presentation, but I guess there's still, there may be people with questions in their mind about the effect on the baby. Um, because have people that have had the vaccine during pregnancy since yes, had children? Yes, lots of them. Yeah, and there's nothing, I know several of them, and babies are all fine, yeah. There is nothing inherent in this technology that would make us worry about that. Um, and we're seeing no signal. As I said, now there are millions and millions of people who've been vaccinated. Mm. There are many, many babies that have been born and there's nothing, nothing showing up. Yourself, have you been vaccinated yet? I haven't, because I'm in group four and I get, um, uh, they see, I think it's the 18th of August or something is when, so next week is when I get to make my appointment. I'm quite excited. <laughs> and I'm assuming because we're all having Pfizer that that will be your f first Ooh, that's what yeah, you'll that's be having. A, that's, that's the one that we're getting. And in many ways, I'm um, kind of relieved that we ended up going for one thing because it would have been very complicated. Um, the reason for going for the portfolio was partly that, uh, they, you know, we didn't know which ones were going to work and which ones were, weren't and which ones would be more effective than others. Um, but there are also, for some of the other vaccines, there are reasons why some people can't get them. That's not the case for Pfizer. Almost, almost everyone can get the Pfizer. There, will be, there might be specific health conditions, in which case... Your doctor will have told you already about that. But um, I'm really glad that there is no kind of, oh, I want that one and not that one, because I say the best vaccine is the one in your arm rather than the one that's in the shelf. Um, but it may well be that we do use a different vaccine for younger children. So the trials on the Pfizer vaccine are ongoing at the moment. Um, I think the 5 to 12-year-old data is due in about September, October time, and then the younger children, that, that data is due later in the year. Um, there have been a couple of little signals that there might be something rare that happens um, in that, although, again, it's rarer than infection. But one of the vaccines that is looking really good is the Novavax, and that is using this protein. So instead of giving the mRNA so we make the protein, the Novavax is the spike protein. And that technology, the protein subunit vaccines, are basically what we do for most childhood vaccines, so we know they're really safe in kids. And so it's, it may well end up being that actually that's the one that is given to children, um, in which case that's, that's great because it's a technology we know. Um, and so I think probably most parents would feel more comfortable with that. But we're, again, we're just waiting on the data. Um, and so that will hopefully be later on in the year. Mm. I'd like to go to the floor now if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask of Susie. We have some roaming mics. Michael. That's a great question. Where does COVID rank in the hierarchy of viruses? Um, so well, it kind of depends what you mean by where does it rank or what would you rank it on? So one of the talks I give at the moment is why is COVID-19 the pandemic? Like why have we responded the way we have to COVID and not to other things, right? Because we've had Ebola, we've had Zika. So, we, we've had, um, so we've had four pandemics in the last 20 years, starting with SARS, uh, which is the... Um, the relative of this, uh, this virus, um, so severe acute respiratory syndrome, it emerged in Hong Kong in about 2002, I think it was, uh, was pretty damn scary, pretty lethal, it's a, a little bit more lethal than this one, um, but it, it, got, it, it got stopped really quickly, it got stopped by stopping human-to-human -human transmission, and the reason it could be stopped is because people who had SARS had a very high fever very early on in infection. So I don't know whether you, if you were, if anyone was traveling around the world at that time, but in 2002, 2003, there were thermal cameras everywhere. And that was how you identified someone with SARS and then they got isolated. So this is so different because although it's not as deadly as that, people are infectious before they know it. Um, this one we've got, you know, the fact that we've had so many more people infected means that we're seeing all the rare stuff, which you might not see with other things because they were stopped earlier. Um, so it's certainly 
bad. Um, the I guess as you know, viruses are different to bacteria in that we we have antibiotics to treat most bacteria, almost most bacteria. Um, whereas we have very few viral antiviral agents, um, so that's kind of tricky and that's something that has been worked on. So it may well be if a whole bunch of antiviral drugs come on the market, that might also mean that we you know, can start treating people um, more easily than we can at the moment. Um, but it's it's kind of yeah. So there's there's uh, there's a disease um, that I think is kind of more serious, but it's one. I guess the so people are really bad at um, at understanding risk. Who here is frightened of sharks? Okay, uh, all right. Who would I mean? You wouldn't want to be in the water, one, right? Who's frightened of mosquitoes? Okay, so nobody's frightened. Of, oh, one person's frightened of mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are like orders of magnitude more dangerous than sharks. But we have a really bad, like we probably, it's, it'll be a shark that gives you a nightmare, right? Not a mosquito. Um, so I think this is the same, that we're like, we're really bad at identifying risk. And so we have, there are infectious diseases around the world still that we don't think of as risky or dangerous. Influenza is really dangerous. We lose hundreds of people every year, thousands of people around the world every year to influenza. Um, flu, right? But somehow, because when people get a cold, they think that's flu, we think we know what flu is and we're not scared of flu anymore, right? If you've had influenza, you don't want it again. It's pretty nasty. Um, one of the diseases that I used to study is tuberculosis. So this is a bacterial disease and um, it's bloody awful. Uh, it takes a really long time to kill you, which is why people probably aren't scared of it anymore. Um, and uh, most people, um, so it's, a, it's another one that's breathed in the air. About a third of the world's population have it, and most people don't even know it. Um, and it's one of the things that I wish we'd really learnt from, because it's a, a really good example of how we shouldn't let... COVID, how we should be dealing with COVID-19 better. So 100 years ago, tuberculosis was one of the leading causes of death in the world. Um, we, we, uh, Mar um, oh, there's a really famous writer, Catherine, Man uh, Catherine Manfield, is it Mansfield? She died of tuberculosis. There's loads of really famous old people who died of tuberculosis. It was sort of uh, a few hundred years ago, it was like the um, heroin chic of the day. It was the disease you got that was really fashionable until they realized it was infectious and then it wasn't fashionable anymore. Um, but this was a disease that one, it became one of the very first to be treated with antibiotics. And so when antibiotics were developed in, in sort of 50s and 60s, this suddenly was a disease that was treatable and then people didn't die of it anymore. Except if you lived in a country that didn't have access to antibiotics. And what happened in those countries is they treated it with antibiotics, but they didn't treat it properly with antibiotics because it's a really hard bacteria to kill. So it takes about six months with four different drugs. And most people start to feel better, so they stop taking the drugs before the six months is up. And that means, just like we saw in the video, we have evolved drug-resistant tuberculosis. And now there are strains of drug-resistant tuberculosis circulating all around the world, and they are we're all vulnerable to them because our antibiotics don't work anymore. So it's like that's the lesson I wish we'd learned with COVID. Like it, when antibiotics were developed, we should have treated everybody with tuberculosis and then we would have got rid of, rid of it completely, but we didn't. And now we're all at risk, regardless of how much money we have, because we don't have drugs that will kill it anymore. And this is kind of what's what I fear will happen with COVID, that we're basically everywhere we allow it to to grow, to transmit, is an opportunity to, to, to grow something that is going to kill us all. And that just seems ludicrous when we could actually fix this, right? There's a really interesting analysis done that suggested that it would cost about $8 billion and take a year um, to make enough Pfizer vaccine for 80% of the world's poorest population. Six months of that would be spent making the five plants, 13 production lines that would take about 1,500 people to make enough vaccine. And so that, that's doable, right? That's like pocket change for all our billionaires. That's more than they, you know, that's like what they make in a day or something. So this is like completely doable, but um, there's no will to do that because it requires sharing patents and sharing technology and stuff. And so it's really sad that we're in this, the kind of world that we have now is one that would um, prioritize uh, profit over you know, getting this, getting these drugs out to people. It's crazy. Sorry, it was a long answer. It's really bad.
It also makes me really think, you know how there's this phrase, avoid something like the plague? Turns out we don't avoid the plague. We run towards it with open arms, with our masks off, going, infect me. It's crazy. Any other questions? Hi. Um, we've got quite a few staff in our Adelaide property in Australia and there's been a lot of, um, I guess, changes in government position on the vaccines. So particularly the AstraZeneca vaccine where governments have come out and said don't do it for under 60 and then don't do it for under 40. What's your kind of view on that kind of change in position? Because a lot of the people that I've spoken to there say um, they've got a choice. They can either wait six months for Pfizer um, or for that to become available, or they have a choice now where they're getting that option to have the AstraZeneca? Um, so, so this is all about balancing risks. And I guess if you'd asked me three months ago, <laughs> uh, I might have said, well, you, uh, you might be best to wait. Although it's, I mean, so the, so the complications, the blood co complications from AstraZeneca are very rare. Um, and I think there's some data that's suggesting actually, um, you know, um, you know, that I can't even remember. Um, it's only very rare, right? Whether it's different for the other vaccines, I can't remember now. Um, but the fact is that Australia is in a really bad place right now. And so the best, vac you know, you're best to be protective, whatever the vaccine, because we know your chances if you get COVID-19 of having a complication, it might not be a blood clot one, but it'll be something else, are uh, orders of magnitude higher. And so the, the watching what's happening in New South Wales, the reality is it's unclear whether they're gonna be able to pull that back. And so the, what Australians should be asking themselves is what does this mean for Australia? Like, you know, they have porous borders. Does this mean you basically build a moat around New South Wales and then it becomes everyone else and New South Wales? Um, so I would be saying to people, if you've got the option to be vaccinated, you should be vaccinated, especially if you're someone who would be more vulnerable. And that's a really hard thing, right? Because none of us like to think of ourselves as vulnerable. And I've seen this, I remember this in the, in the first part of the pandemic when you would say, you know, people over 60 are vulnerable. And my parents were over six. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not elderly. <laughs> right? So there's, there's a kind of funny thing about what, what, how people see themselves. And I think a lot of people don't see themselves as, you know, it's like I'm not 90, so I'm not vulnerable. We know that this is killing young people. We know this is killing perfectly healthy people. Um, you're best to be vaccinated, and I think that's probably really true now in Australia. Yeah, so that's actually something, so again, the UK, because they didn't really care who had what, they were just like in arms, and so what they've, that's ended up happening is that people have had an AstraZeneca for their first shot, or a Pfizer for their first shot, and then something else. It does look like, so we know that AstraZeneca is not as good as the Pfizer, and it looks like actually the combination of an AstraZeneca with a Pfizer booster is really good, um, so that that's, uh, yeah, so that would may well be the way, but it will then depend on Again, you're better off fully vaccinated, <laughs> but it may well be that for many countries, the booster might be a Pfizer um, or an mRNA vaccine of some sort. Um, the really cool news I saw the other day is that um, in South Africa, they've just made, they've just, they've, so they've been uh, trying to make their own formulations of this stuff. And so there's an agreement just been signed. The WHO is all behind it. So it looks like South Africa is going to start making an mRNA vaccine too. So there may well be you know, more than just Pfizer and Moderna on the market soon. Any other questions? I hope that's helped. I hope that I've answered some of your questions. Um, and I hope that you will... Uh, I hope that you will get vaccinated. This is really the thing that gives us possibilities kind of moving forward. Um, certainly, yeah.
protects. I, I'm, I'm going to be there. And I, I hope I might be at the top of the Sky Tower. That would be so awesome. We would love you to get vaccinated <laughs> at the top of the Sky Tower, Susie. And you could bring your friends Sean and Michael Baker with you. That'd be even better. do my best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I'm sure, Michael, would you like to say a quick thank you? Um, look, Dr. Sudi, that, that was just awesome to hear, uh, you know, just the, the facts of, uh, of, of, of the world we live in, and it was incredibly informative and, and useful for all of us. So, uh, and, uh, you know, the message is very clear, get vaccinated. Uh, whichever one you can get into your arm, you should get it into your arm. And we're lucky enough here in New Zealand that it's all, all Pfizer. But thank you very much for sharing your insights and your time with us. Um, and we all of our, on behalf of all of our 4,200 people, uh, most of whom are, are, will be tuning into this, uh, we really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Thank you. Give Dr. Susie a round, round Sky City warm of applause. Thank you. Thank you.